Akcelerace. Slovo, které snad nejlépe vystihuje současný vývoj světa a termín, který je styčným bodem světa sportu a biznisu. O tom, jak funguje mysl sportovce a jak dostat svého svěřence na olympijské stupně vítězů, přichází pohovořit spoluzakladatel Leadership Academy of Barcelona Stephen P. McGregor. Hello. So I hope she was saying nice things about me. I don't understand so much Czech, right? Um, so this is going to be in English, uh, and lucky for you, it's not going to be in Scottish, right? Um, but um, real pleasure to be here. This is my first time in Prague, uh, home to one of my all-time heroes, uh, who I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing the architecture and, 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 and understanding more of the history of Prague. And because I'm Scottish, uh, enjoying some nice Czech beer later on this evening. Uh, so this is the part, I'm going to talk about new challenges within uh, body and mind uh, and talk about this thing called the hateful eight. So I'm Scottish, but I come here today from Barcelona. I've been living in Spain for 13 years. Uh, this is a view of the city uh, of Barcelona in this first slide. Uh, and if you know also, they have quite a good football team. Right, uh, And uh, believe it or not, I signed for Football Club Barcelona a couple of years ago, the same season as Neymar Jr. So this is me uh, actually running for the club. So, you know, the club, Football Club Barcelona, is a sports club. Uh, and I've been a runner for uh, most of my life. So because of that, uh, I, I've thought about the link between sport uh, and business. And I've often thought about this, this question, what do an elite sportsman or woman and an elite executive have in common? Okay, so let's look at elite sports to begin with. I'm gonna give you some photographs of elite sports, uh, sportsmen in this case, they're all men. Uh, and I want you to think about who is the person uh, and uh, in which Olympic games did they win gold and in which events, okay? So this is the first one. Very easy one to start, right? So I'm not going to ask you to shout out because there's too many people. I can't actually see anyone. Uh, but if you have it really clear, I want you to lift, raise your hands, right? If you're only kind of semi-clear on the events and things, maybe you just go like this with your hand, right? You don't go all the way up, okay? So this one, very easy, right? I think everyone should have their hands up for this one, right? No? Why not? Okay, so this is, right, Usain Bolt, he won gold in London 2012 in the 100, 200, and the sprint relay. Very easy, okay? Next one. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. So again, if you're very clear who this is and, and in which event he won gold, or which games, hand right up. If you're only kind of semi-sure, maybe about here. Again, maybe not so bad, right? Carl Lewis, Los Angeles, 1984. Wow, already. Seems so long, not so long ago, right? 100, 200, sprint relay, and the long jump was the extra one, right? But we can't give the sprinters all the glory, and this is my, one of my all-time heroes right here. So who's this? You should get this, right? Hands, everyone, for this one, right? So Emil Zatopek, the Czech locomotive, uh, and he won gold in Helsinki, uh, in 1952, it wasn't his only goals, but this was the big Olympics for him in which he won the three golds. No one has ever done that since. All the African domination, even more Farah nowadays, no one has ever ran and, and won gold at the five and the ten and, and the marathon. The final one, the final one, who's this? Also an Olympic gold medalist, right? I don't know if anyone maybe gets that. But anyway, this is an Olympic gold medalist. He is Pierre de Coubertin, and he won a gold medal in Stockholm in 1912. And he won an Olympic gold medal in the event of literature. Right? So Pierre de Coubertin, he was an Olympic gold medalist, but he is also important in Olympic history because he is the founder of the modern Olympic Games. And just like the ancient Greek Olympics, he wanted the modern Olympics not to just be a test of strength and physical prowess, but also intellectual capability. In the ancient Greek Olympics, they had champions in music, in sculpture, in literature, and music. 
as well as all of the other physical events, right? So even if we look at someone like Plato, the, the famous Greek philosopher, he said this. He said, in order for man to succeed in life, he was provided with two means, education and physical activity. Not separately, but for these things together. And with these things, we can attain perfection. So this has been the focus of my life the last 10 years, trying to mix in business notions of the physical self and the importance of health, not just for health's sake, but for performance. So what we get today in business, we mostly get things like this, that if you're at the top level in business, then you're gonna compromise your health. But I don't think it has to be like that. We have to improve our health and our well-being, but also if we think of the business case of having a healthier heart, of moving more, of sleeping more, like an elite athlete, I think we can succeed more in business. This is another, I'm the final athlete. I don't know if anyone recognizes this guy, but he's a marathon runner, and his name is Jose Maria Alvarez Payete, right? He's the CEO, or he's going to be the new CEO of Telefonica. This was just announced last week. And I interviewed him for my book uh, last year, uh, and this is what he talked about. He said, if you ask me what's next, I enjoy so much what I'm doing now that I'm not necessarily planning for the next step. And in the interview that I had with him, he focused on his day-to-day. -day. Much like an athlete, he wasn't thinking about you know, the business quarter or the next financial year. Of course, these things are important. But for him personally, he was thinking about his day, his 24-hour day. So for you, in your own life and your own business, What's it like as a busy professional? When was the last time that you thought about your 24-hour day and how life and business and health and emails and meetings and all these things fit within that day? I've looked into the history of work in the 24-hour day quite, quite a lot the last couple of years. This is a photo of Robert Owen. So Robert Owen was very important at the, the start of the Industrial Revolution because he looked at improving the conditions of workers. At the start of the Industrial Revolution, uh, companies were often making uh, human beings as all work like machines, because we had machines for the first time. And then Owen came just next to Glasgow, actually, and he had the new Lanark Mills. It was a textile mill, and he wanted to improve the conditions of the workers. And he thought, you know, it isn't just about improving their health or their well-being. This is going to improve the performance of the business. So he was the first man that looked at the balance of work, play, and rest within a 24-hour period. And he, he advocated for eight hours for each of those things in a serial fashion. So you had eight hours of work. You followed that by eight hours of play or leisure. And then you had eight hours of rest. A very romantic notion. I don't think it's so much in today's business world. So this is what I think today. I think today we've moved towards what I call the hateful eight. So this is the, based on the Quentin Tarantino movie of uh, last year, right? But we, we, we hate these eight hours, or many workers hate these eight hours. Why is that? I think it's because, first of all, you know that in this first period of eight, you're only expected to work but you know that work is going to go extending out with this first eight hours. So it's hateful there. It's also hateful in this middle eight because leisure and life, I think, is squeezed out by more work. And then finally, in this third eight, your rest is compromised, mostly your sleep by work stress. So what I'm saying, how can we move beyond this hateful eight to go for better performance? I think the first thing, uh, or, or how do we not go crazy, right? How do we think about stress, but also do we think about performance? It's just one of the, sh the shots from, from the movie, the hateful eight, right? So first of all, what I think is that we need to recognize that performance isn't just work. Work or, or business shouldn't just be work. Business should be thinking about performance. And performance, like in elite sport, is the equation, it is the sum of not just of work, but work plus play plus rest. So thinking about all of these three things in play to get that higher performance. And I think the key related to that is this next thing. How can we allow people to bring more of themselves to work? 
It's about rest, it's about play, but recognizing in this first eight hours, it doesn't just have to be exclusively work. And if we go back to Payette, this interview, he said this, he said, you know, I was asking him about the balance for him as a senior executive with, with, you know, lots of demands, and he said, you're the same person in both places, in both the workplace and home. He said, it's not as if you go home with your heart, not your head, or not that you go to work with your head, but not your heart. So we are the same person. So what I'm saying, how can we allow people to bring more of themselves into the workplace? Because we will expect that work will exist in these other areas within that 24-hour period. So how do we lead beyond the hateful eight? What are some of the things that we can think about, both in terms of self-leadership, how we lead ourselves, but also how we lead our teams and other people? There's three things, I think. The first one is, is this. You like, or preferably love, what you do. If you hate what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't want it to extend within those first eight hours. So if you're gonna expect that you have the margin for your life within the workplace, that you have notions of rest and play, you will have work extending into the, the home place, it's better that you love what you do, you have a passion for what you do. And I, much of the literature and research has shown that if we are passionate about what we do, our teams also, then you'll get that higher level of commitment, of engagement, of performance. So number one, you like, preferably love what you do. Number two, uh, you are part of a results-based culture. So I think the days are gone whereby we measured work in terms of visibility. That workers were sitting at a desk, maybe with their head down, you know, intently focused on the work that they were doing. Sometimes, for the best results, we need to get out of the office. Sometimes, for the best results, we need to have a 10-minute nap within the office, right? Sometimes, for the best results, we need to go for a walk to think about solving a tough problem. So today, the workplace, it shouldn't performance or results, it shouldn't be on visibility, it should be on the results that your team delivers for you. So are you creating, are you part of a results-based culture? And the third one, uh, basic human needs are recognized as key for results. So mobility, nutrition, sleep. In your business, are you providing good, nutritious food choices? Not just because it's gonna be healthier for your team, but because research has shown that it will affect the quality of the decisions that they will take during the day. Are you paying attention to the signs whereby you can say to your team member, hey, you look really tired. I mean, are you sleeping well? Did you have lunch today? This is part of leadership today, I think. It's not isolated within work. It's looking at this balance between work and life. So those are the three things that I think are important. Um, and, and just to finish off, you know, it's turning the hateful eight on its side. So it's looking at this kind of, you know, this is a shape of an infinity loop. So it's actually thinking that work and rest and play, they are kind of always present to an extent. Work will always be, I guess, the focus of, of course, Monday to Friday and the first part of the day, but it can exist in other areas. And I'm saying that play and rest should also exist in these other areas. So we have this very harmonious type approach to going for the best results, to try and looking at, you know, not just this work narrow focus. And I think that is what true business elasticity is. It's not just work, it's about top performance. And if I can just finish with one quote from a business leader who knows how to have this balance, to have this elasticity. It's a quote from A.G. Laffley, who was the CEO on two occasions of Procter & Gamble, and he was talking about how he changed his approach to work, right? And this is just on a, on a little level, but I think it's symptomatic of this elasticity. He said, I used to grind through a long day. Now I work really hard for an hour, an hour and a half, then I take a break, uh, you know, I walk around and chit-chat with people. It can take five or 15 minutes to recharge. It's kind of like interval training like an athlete does. And just bringing it back right to the beginning, does anyone know who the inventor of interval training was? 
It was Atopec. It was Atopec, right? So the key to all of this, <laughs> the key to leading beyond the hateful eight to having true top performance through business elasticity, it comes from here. It comes from the Czech Republic and it comes from Emil Zatopek. So that's it. Many, many thanks for your attention. Thank you.